When you look at the European Union, just now, I will show you the steps of integration, but I will be not defining, but only just to show you where we are and what we are talking about. Here would be so-called free trade area. When you look at the US, the US have free trade area with Mexico and, and Canada. The second step would be customs union. The third one is called common market. Common market is an agreement between two or more countries in result of what they have been implementing so-called four freedoms. Free movement of goods, free movement of services, free movement of capital, and free movement of labor. And then we have fourth step, which is called monetary union. And maybe one day we will have we will have also political union like the United States or Switzerland or Canada. So when I am talking, when you are reading about the European Union, you see those two places here. So in monetary union, we have just now 17 countries, and in common market, we have 10 countries. So in total, we have 27 countries within the European Union. Those countries, 17 countries, has, have been using one currency, which is Euro, and the 10 countries here have been using their national currencies. Some, that, some information at the beginning, and then I will discuss it. Sometimes you heard that the money, European money, or European Monetary Union is dying, that is going down because of crisis, because of currency crisis. There is no currency crisis within the European Union. We have problems, I will be talking about this problem, or about those problems, but no currency problems. When you look, Euro was implemented in 1999. I will tell a little bit about the history of the implementation of Euro, but in a minute. So here we have exchange rate, euro against dollar, was here 1999, and let's say we have 2013. So when you look at the relationships between euro and dollars, it's looked like this. Something like that. So it's very difficult to read mathematicians, or mathematicians will be easier to read the relationships. So we have been showing usually trends, and the trends are followed. So you see that at the beginning, Euro was losing against US dollar. Up to 2001, and since 2001, the role of Euro and the price of Euro is growing up. When you look also at the numbers, how much businesses and households maintain, households maintain of euros or of dollars at the beginning, we can say that in euros they maintained at the beginning of 1999 approximately 12, 13 day wealth of their wealth. This means uh, foreign reserves were maintained in Europe. And the rest, either in US dollars or other foreign currencies, like Japanese yen or British pound, etc. Nowadays, beginning of 2013, it is maintained or hold approximately 42-43% in euros. So the role of euro is going up, is increasing. The question, of course, is, first question, for what reason Europe decided to implement Europe? There is no one answer, unfortunately. It depends whom you meet and who is going to talk to you. 
They are people who are talking that only or mostly for economic reasons. Reason number one was just to avoid so-called transactional costs. So during the trade, you have to have a national currency or internal currency, and you are exchanging uh, other currency into national currency. So you are always paying the fee for that. Number two, some would say that to avoid speculations on financial markets, because speculations depend on supply and demand for currencies. And number three, to implement one price for one good. Can you imagine that within the European Union, so within common market, you could buy a car, Audi, in Germany, in Hamburg, for 70,000 Deutschmark before implementation of Euro, and in Copenhagen, in Denmark, for 40,000 Deutschmark. There was no reason to differentiate prices, but they were differentiated because <coughs> the suppliers wanted to make, or traders wanted to make extra money. So having one currency, you exactly know what you have to pay here in Florida and then in Arizona if you are buying car or land or, or whatever. And people are clever, but not clever enough to calculate immediately if they have to pay in two or three different currencies. But I think, generally speaking, that the reasons for implementation of Euro were more complicated. They're, they were not such objective, and they were rather political reasons, not economic reasons. Reason number one, to some extent, economic and political, was the crisis in Asian countries at the beginning and in the middle of the 90s. It was huge financial crisis, mostly in Japan, but not only in Japan. And the US dollar at that time and nowadays paid important and big role in the world's economy. And the Europeans afraid what would or what was going to happen in the case of returning of US dollar to the United States. Because as you probably know, when you have seen that 100 percent of US dollars were printed or were issued, only five to seven percent is in circulation within the United States and the rest all over the world. So this is important for the world. What is going to happen with American economy and in particular with US money, with American money. So they are afraid that maybe one day we will be observing a huge rate of inflation. And inflation would mean that a lot of countries and a lot of businesses would lose a lot. So it would be, we would observe destabilization of the economy and destabilization of the financial system. So the Europeans said that we have to have, or at least they told, that we have to have strong currency which could replace US dollar. And no single currency at that time was strong enough to replace the US dollar. The number two reason was to deepen a process of integration within the European Union. Because in the end of the 80s and beginning of the 90s, many countries didn't want to have European Union. We observed at that time globalization and everybody was thinking that globalization could replace regional integration. They were asking the questions, for what reason do we need European Union? For what reason should we pay for the bureaucrats in Brussels? European Union is bringing not much to us. It was a huge discussion at the time in Europe. What should we do with European Union? 
and a group of people appeared. Older people who survived Second World War. And they said, you critics, you are right. European Union is not the best solution. European Union is costly thing. European Union is not efficient enough economically. You are absolutely right. But European Union has one positive characteristic. People living within European Union do not, are not killing each other for everything. Europeans in the past were always stupid. In this sense, that they were killing each other because one went to this church, to another, to another church. One was white, the another was dark. One was rich, the another was poor, etc. They were always <coughs> reason or reasons to kill each, to kill each another. And in the result of establishing the European Union for 60 years, or even just now more than 60 years. We didn't experience any war in European Union. So some people said that European Union is needed, if not for economic and financial reasons, for political reasons. So, but they said that to do that, we have to have something which help us to tighten the relationships. And they said, that the such thing, economic thing, will be, or factor, will be money. And they return to the paper which was written by Canadian economists living, or American economists living in Canada, presently working at Columbia University, Robert Mandel, who wrote a paper at the beginning of 60s, in 63, published, and who was proving in his paper that countries which differ very much economically, financially, politically, socially, under certain circumstances can build one system, one financial system. They came to this point, nobody believed that the <coughs> American professors were writing papers and joking about euro fantasy. From left to the right, Franco Mogiliani was joking, the left-thinking American Nobel Prize winner. Milton Friedman was joking, Rudy Gen Dornbusch was joking, etc. Nobody believed. And all the requirements were presented, and the Europeans started to work on that. But, of course, they, they wanted also to present economic requirements to be fulfilled to create a European monetary union, because now I'm talking about rather political reasons. But before I say something about the economic requirements, I will indicate one more reason for what the European Monetary Union was implemented. Germany, I mean almost everybody at the beginning of the 90s, afraid of the power of Germany. In particular, French, <coughs> but not only French. So they thinking, they were thinking, Europeans were thinking, what to do, what way to go to control German financial, so monetary and fiscal policy. And they told that no single country will be able to do that, only when we establish union, we will be controlling each other. So, at least three and other reasons appeared for implementation of European Monetary Union and single currency. I am telling you this because nowadays we mostly discuss when we analyze, or when the economists analyze the situation within European Union, uh, within European Monetary Union, they look from financial and economic perspective. They are forgetting about the social reasons, political reasons, and they are discussing mostly about effectiveness of European Monetary Union, which is not extremely high. I will be talking about that later. And just now, what criteria were 
required to fulfill to join the European Union or the European Monetary Union or as it was called a club of gentlemen. Just now, sometimes you can read that the European Monetary Union is called a club of cheaters. But in the past, it was called the club of, of gentlemen. They were so-called five mastery criteria, economic criteria. Mastery criteria, so country which was going to join European Union had to have low rate of inflation, no time to define that just now, low rate of interest rate, low budget deficit, low public debt, and stable uh, money, so stable exchange rate. Low public debt means below 60% of uh, GDP, and low budgetary deficit means less than 3% of budget deficit. And again, Europe never was homogen homogeneous region. Europe, were, were, Europe differed very much. In Europe, we had and we had countries which were fulfilling all the criteria always, mostly northern countries and western countries, northern Scandinavian countries, Germany, the Netherlands, Austria, plus Germany, Netherlands, Austria, and Benelux countries. <coughs> and we had countries which in the past almost never fulfilled those criteria. Southern countries like Spain, Portugal, Greece, part of Italy or the whole Italy, and some other places. So to fulfill the criteria for some countries, the five Maastricht, so called Maastricht criteria, was very easy. Because they already had low rate of inflation, low interest rates, and low budgetary and public debt. And they were the countries which had very high rate of inflation, very high interest rates, and very high budget and, uh, uh, and uh, uh, public debt. But they wanted to be part of the club. They wanted to have easy access to capital, and they wanted to be seen on international markets because of foreign investment, because of appreciation, because of different things. So they said it's diff diff difficult that we would fulfill all the criteria. So they cut expenditures, they implemented taxes, etc. Finally, in a few years, they fulfilled the criteria and the Commission said, you are ready to join the European Monetary Union. So they were fighting for 24, for 36 months, or even longer. Finally, they did, and they said, we are just now in heaven. Why in heaven? Because they joined the group, for example, in some of those countries, interest rates were around 11, 12%. And they joined the club, the union, they joined the countries where interest, rate, interest rates were 3.54%, three times lower. So they said, because we were suffering for so many years to join the club, now it's time to consume. Now it's time to live good. So, Number one, households were willing to borrow money to buy houses, to buy new cars, to go for vacation, to buy land in Central and Eastern Europe because they were expecting that the prices of land will go up after joining the European Union. We are talking about the years 2000, 2001, 2003. Governments 
were willing to invest money in schools, in universities, in healthcare, in education, in pension funds, etc. Businesses were willing to invest in new machineries, in equipment, etc. etc. <coughs> so everybody was very enthusiastic about this economic situation, about the future, and everybody wanted to live better. And there is super, so this is the demand side. And on the other side, we have supply side. We have German banks, French banks, we have Dutch banks, Austrian banks, etc. <coughs> so we have banks in the nations which usually had what kind of philosophy? First, work, then save, then invest, and then enjoy your life. The first group had completely different philosophy. First enjoy life, then maybe work, then maybe save, then maybe invest. So now everybody was in the same group in monetary union. So they went, the borrowers from southern countries went to the banks and the banks said to them, welcome, finally you <coughs> came to us. Because our citizens, our businesses were not interested in borrowing money. They were interested in saving money. And to make money, to make profit, banks have to lend money, not only borrow money. So they were looking for the borrowers. And they came from those countries and the bankers said, please, how much do you want? No problem, we are lending you money, do your business, etc. And they were borrowing, I mean, <coughs> banks were borrowing, state was borrowing, households were borrowing, and everybody was happy, everything was blue. And we have 2005, 2006. And 2007, or end of 2006, the crisis, financial crisis appeared. <coughs> Infection from the overseas, from the US, came. So they invested also in financial assets. Finally, for some reasons, nobody was willing to buy the financial assets they invested. Crisis. So they could not sell the assets, they could not repay, and the debt <coughs> increased, rose, huge debt. How big is the debt? Frankly, nobody knows. We are talking about few billion, few, few trillions of US dollars. But frankly, nobody knows what is the debt in the world. <coughs> that is quite huge. What we know is just now that it, within the European Union is estimated at approximately, you know, uh, three and a half, maybe up to five trillion of US dollars. When you look, when you calculate per capita, and when you look at so called peaks countries, in general, peaks. Portugal, Ireland, Greece, and Spain. The worst situation is per capita in Ireland. It is estimated that on average, the Irish guy is in debt at approximately $135,000. So it means that it takes them 50, 60 years to repay. In the southern countries, it's a little bit better because it's something around 20, 25,000 of US dollars. So it's a huge problem. But it's not the biggest problem. It is a problem, but the biggest problem is extremely high rate of unemployment in many places. Why is high rate of unemployment? Because they are producing. The cost of production is relatively high and they are not selling their goods and services. So they have to close their businesses. Closing businesses means that they have to fire people. 
and in particular, we have been observing difficult situation in Spain. Among young people, graduates from the university, <coughs> the rate of unemployment is established at approximately something between 45 and 50 percent. And on average, 25, 26 percent among the average population. So it's, it's, it's high. So it's, it's bad. It's not good. We observe also a low level of GDP growth. I mean, around 0.2 percent. We would have a recession in this region, but fortunately, we have Germany in Monetary <laughs> Union, and in Germany, we have been observing positive growth, positive around 1.5, 1.7 percent. So, in the Union here, among the 70 countries, is approximately 0.2, 0.3 percent. Germany is an important country because it has sometimes first, sometimes second position in the world in foreign trade. So it's it's an important country, uh, very important in Europe in terms of economic growth. It's bad just now because, as you see, we have been creating or building Europe of so-called two speedies. One is monetary union and the other is common market. But among those countries, here being within monetary union, we have also two, at least two groups of countries. The first group, they are so-called core countries, Germany, France, the Netherlands, Austria, Scandinavian countries. And the second group, are so-called pigs, <laughs> pigs countries. <coughs> Ironically, so this Portugal, Ireland, Italy, Greece, and Spain. And ironically, Italy, you heard sometimes about G7 countries. And on one side, Italy is among G7. On the other side, Italy is among the pigs countries. So, and just now, the biggest problem you have heard was here in Greece. But Greece is not the biggest country. So partly the problem was solved, and money was <coughs> lended to Greece to repay the debt. But the problem also exists here in Portugal, Spain, and Italy. Why Greece first? Because the maturity of the credits or the time expired and Greece was to pay to or to repay the duties or the credits. And here the time is still to come. So it is a problem. So what is the solution? <coughs> what are the scenarios? I have to go faster. Excellent. <laughs> They are, I am saying or I am telling, they are at least four scenarios or five scenarios. Some scenarios very complicated, some less complicated. Almost all of them are impossible to implement. Scenario number one, the easiest one. Just implement or we should implement restrictive financial policy. What does it mean? We should cut the wages, we should cut expenditures, governmental or state expenditures, we should implement higher taxes, and we should implement more restrictive monetary policy. And frankly, the European Union Commission was trying to do in Greece and Athens barns. So the Greeks do not want to agree. Do we have any positive experience of such restrictive monetary, monetary policy? Yes, we do. Where? In so-called Baltic states, Estonia, Lithuania, Latvia. 
few years ago they implemented such restrictive uh, financial policy and in the result Estonia fulfilled the criteria and joined European Monetary Union. But eastern part of Europe is not southern of, or western. In post-Soviet countries they could do that, but in more democratic countries I would say with with so civil societies, it's extremely difficult to do that. So, problem is not solved. Second scenario. So, this first one, in an as entire solution, not possible to implement. Second scenario, restructurization of debt, just cutting the debt. Under assumption, under assumption that they were borrowers who were willing to borrow money and they were lenders which were willing to lend money. The fault is on both sides. We are cutting by 50% or 60% or 40%. Doesn't matter. And probably they would agree, but the problem is that there are some countries which were not borrowing money and which were not lending money. So they are asking the question, why them and not us? Why are you going to help the part of the world, of Europe? And we, because we're, we were doing properly, we will be suffering because of that. And the decisions in Europe are being made on consensus. So it is almost impossible to convince the countries which are not in debt to agree to help the other countries. Scenario number three, Argentinization of Europe. Argentinization means that we dealt with similar situation some years ago in Argentina. So what are Argentina did? Argentina devaluated Argentinian peso. Why devaluation? Simply in order to increase the competitiveness of the country. The goods and services being produced in country A are becoming cheaper. Well, but the problem is that some countries within the European Monetary Union are doing extremely well. What country? Germany. So Germany is of course against devaluation. And some other countries are against devaluation because devaluation would mean destabilization of the financial system. And one of the reasons for implementation in Europe was stabilization of the financial system. So devaluation or Argentinization of Europe is almost impossible to do. So scenario number four. It's no time to discuss more the scenario. Scenario number four. Resurrection of Europe. Resurrection of Europe means that we are coming to the point where we have to help each other. Because Europe was also about solidarity between the countries. And we have forgotten solidarity. And just now we are coming to the point that we have to help those who are not successful. How to help those? By giving simple money, they will lose this money. Or not properly use this money. So probably it's not the best way. So we, it is discussed that maybe political integration is needed. Political integration means also common or joint government. Commission to some extent, it is common government. But as you know, European Monetary Union was based only on one pillar, monetary policy. And we have at least another one more pillar, fiscal policy. So it is said 
that just now we have to implement fiscal policy. We means who? A special institution, Treasury Department, or agency, whatever the name of the agency would be. So in another words, this agency would be responsible for what? For budgets of each single state. But up to now, as you know, for budget, who is responsible? Irresponsible. Parliament. So we could imagine that we are building agency or Ministry of Finance, European Ministry of Finance, and the budget is accepted by national parliament, and then it goes to the European Ministry of Finance. And the people in the Ministry, European Ministry of Finance say, no, we cannot agree. Expenditures are too high, and income is too low. Do one more time. <coughs> so in such situation, we would ask a question, for what reason do we need parliament? Resolve, resolve parliament. But people and nations think that they are independent. You cannot say in the country somewhere that your national parliament is not needed because they will feel bad. They feel that parliaments are important. No, <laughs> not very many <laughs> believe in it. But anyway, I think. So maybe we could see the opposite situation. First, the budget is being prepared by Minister of European Minister of Finance, accepted, and then it goes to the Parliament. But let's assume that populists won election. So the populists say, we cannot accept this budget because expenditures are too low. So in such case, we ask the question, for what reason do we need European Minister of Finance? So it's very difficult to solve this problem from political uh, administrative and legal reasons. But uh, probably lawyers could do that. But there is another problem, economic problem. And we are asking questions, are we going to be the United States of Europe, like the United States of America? If the answer is yes, we have to implement at least two kinds of taxes, state tax and federal tax. Federal tax in the United <coughs> States go to Washington, D.C., and in the case when Alabama, Mississippi, Louisiana, and other terminator California <laughs> is doing badly, money from Washington goes to Alabama, Mississippi, Louisiana, and California. And this is not one nation, one country, etc. Everybody agrees. But there is a problem in Europe. And countries who are net payers, who oh, Germany is asking the question, are we going to be are we going to be agency of transfers or is European Union going to be agency of transfers? Are we going to Americanize European Union? Of course, many answer no. So, not very good scenario. Scenario number five. Chinization of Europe. There is country, China, which has surplus in foreign trade. 3.3 or 3.5 trillion of US dollars. And I mentioned earlier that we exactly need in Europe 3.3 or 3.5 trillion of US dollars. 
And China sometimes is saying, well, professors or jokers or whomever, that we are yet ready to invest this money in Europe under three conditions. Number one, you have to recognize that China is democratic and market-oriented country. Number two, you have to remove all obstacles concerning transfer of new technologies, weapons, etc. And number three, you have to implement serious uh, structural reforms. And we are ready to invest. Five scenarios which are extremely difficult to be implemented. So what? What is the future of European Monetary Union? Is European Monetary Union going to collapse? <clears throat> Some say that it is on the way to collapse. Even Krugman, Nobel Prize winner, used to write that probably European uh, Monetary Union will collapse. I think that European Monetary Union will survive for few reasons. However, I am not 100% convinced. Reason number one, it's very difficult to imagine just now, also from technical point of view, that it could collapse. Why? Because when you are interested in the topic, and when you read books, textbooks, whatever, you will read thousands, just now hundreds of thousands, of sentences, of pages, how to get into European Union. European Monetary Union, sorry. But there is no single <coughs> sentence how to get out. <laughs> so to do that, you have to prepare yourself. You have to discuss, you have to analyze, etc. In particular, in democratic country, and European Union consists of democratic country. Because if we were in not democratic countries, the decision is, can be made very easily. We are going out and problem solved. It doesn't matter how much are we going to pay. Because it will be huge cost. It is discussion what to do with Greece, Portugal, and Spain. Should they be out or should they be in? Sometimes they say that we will withdraw. But you know, it will not change anything. They will lose foreign investors. They will observe devaluation and inflation, etc. So it would be a huge problem. So technically, it is possible or would be possible. But I don't think that we will be in the near future observing collapse of European monetary union. But not only because of that, also because countries, so-called so -called core countries, are interested in maintaining European Union. Who? Germany. And not only Germany, also France, also the Netherlands, Benelux countries, etc. Why? Because it is easy to show they have access to big markets without any obstacles. So goods produced in Hanover can be sold in Dublin without any problem, or in Thessaloniki, or in Athens, etc. So it's a huge, it is almost as big as American market. So it's great. Number two, European institutions are interested in maintaining. I have to finish because everybody will leave. You know? <laughs> European institutions are interested. Why? Number one, European institutions hire 250 or 300,000 people. Highly educated, with connections, with networks, etc. In case of bankruptcy, in case of collapse, they, they would lose their jobs. Nobody is losing, is interested in losing jobs. So they fully 
support the European Monetary Union. Number three, the United States is interested in helping, in supporting, and in maintaining European Monetary Union. Why? Because European Monetary Union just now is second pillar of the world's economy. In the past, America was the policeman number one. Being a policeman is nice thing, but it's costly thing. And the responsibility is very high. And just now, there is some kind of stabilization. We Europeans and you Americans are looking for the third pillar, maybe China. Because on three legs, the world can be more stable than it is today. But not only the United States, also international monetary institutions, like the World Bank, like the IMF, International Monetary Fund, European Bank for Reconstruction, whatever is the proper name, they are also interested in maintaining European monetary union. So I am not saying that it's OK. A lot of problems, and frankly, Europe was not expecting so many problems. I mean, enthusiasm was huge. I mean, almost everybody, almost all single countries believed that after joining, after creating the European Monetary Union, we will be observing convergence. Almost automatically, convergence within the European Monetary Union. Convergence means that the GDP growth will be almost on the same level, that the investment will be on the same level, consumption, etc. A GDP per capita, etc. And we have been observing divergences, divergences of divergences. So it is not automatic convergence. So what to do? I think that countries which are outside the European Union should not give up, should think about joining the European Union, should think about fulfilling the criteria, and join European Monetary Union when they are ready, European Monetary Union is ready, so after the structural changes. Thank you very much.